Greetings, everyone. Lovely to see you all on here. Let me see if I can get my correct camera working. Okay, Vincent, lovely to see you. And uh, Jackson, wonderful to see you. And Candace, of course, we always love to see you here. Now, can you hear me all right, Vincent? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's been a, a busy week here. Anne has just had a little procedure done on her neck. Uh, she was in hospital overnight, but everything went really well with that. She's home and resting and feeling pretty good. So we're thankful to the Lord for that and answered prayer. And uh, we're very pleased that Sunday has come around, uh, uh, Saturday has come around again, and we're able to study once again with you. Uh, I'm not sure if you realize, but there are a lot of people who contact me through the week that are not here necessarily live on a Saturday when we, when we watch it. In many places of the world, data can be very expensive uh, and so to, to uh, it's prohibitive to to be live on him but they're able to watch the uh, the YouTube videos and read the the study notes and so they're very much a part of this as well and so if that's you and you're out there watching this on YouTube we're very thankful that you're with us uh, so we're continuing with our study of the in the Bible series, uh, so this this is lesson number uh, number number six no five I beg your pardon lesson number five and we're in the section uh, where we're looking at authority and truth. Last week we looked by what authority, uh, and of course that's the authority of God. This week. We're going to be looking at the the authority pattern. Uh, now, throughout the Bible, we read of uh, the Lord providing us with patterns, and we need to recognize that this is something fundamental to our understanding and our interpretation of the Bible. God is not a god of confusion. We're told in First Corinthians fourteen. But he wants us to understand uh, what he does. And part of his way of doing that is by showing us patterns. And the human brain looks for patterns. And so if we understand, as we're studying the Bible, that we're looking for patterns, uh, that'll help us in uh, gaining a deeper understanding of God's will for us. Okay, we've got uh, Dominic and Eddie join us. Very happy to see the pair of you. God bless you in Nairobi and in uh, in Bali as well. So I'm going to ask uh, Vincent, if you wouldn't mind, to unmute yourself and open uh, with a prayer for us. That's okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep, so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we come before thee. We want to thank thee for this time that we all once again can set aside this time to gather together to study in a portion of your words. And we thank you for these blessings so that the uh, congregation in different parts of the world can also have the study together. And we thank you so much for our kids, for preparing the lesson to share with us and we ask that you continue to bless him with his effort so that we will be able to continue to have this study on a Saturday afternoon and pray that you also have us as a listener we pray that you will have us to be attentive and pray that the word be spoken the word, the word shared will be able to edify us and help us to grow spiritually. Once again, we pray that you will be in our midst and we ask that this time of study 
will be beneficial to all of us. In Christ, we thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Vincent. Well, it's it feels cold and wet here, but I'm getting hot in here, so I'm going to take off my jumper. So if you excuse me. Ah, okay, now. Excellent. That feels a little bit better. So we're going to be looking initially at how the Lord deals with passions in the Bible. Uh, and as I said, we can see that throughout the scriptures. And if we go over to the book of Genesis, we can see very much there how God teaches us through the patterns that he's given us. Notice Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in verse uh, 9. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and gathered, the gathering of the waters he called seeds. And God saw that it was good. He then said, let the earth sprout vegetation and plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind, and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. This idea of God's command that the earth sprout vegetation and plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them is something that we can see today. And I think we understand what this means. We understand how that all the vegetation around us uh, reproduces by seed. And in that seed, you have the germ of life, which provides the, uh, the, um, the plants that, that follow them. You know, I'm looking outside my window here now, and uh, I can see a bunch of trees and some rose bushes and whatnot. They all started from these seeds, which came from the parent plant. And these are a reproduction of those parent plants. And that's and that's how it happened. This is the pattern that God has given us. And, and this makes farming and uh, gardening very easy because we know if we plant a tomato seed or a certain flower seed, we know what's going to come up there because each plant produces fruit after its own kind. We go, we go on back. So that was that was the third day. We go on back in the um uh in the genesis account uh, and uh we see on the on the uh the fifth day then god said let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth and the open expanse and god created the great sea monsters and every creature that moves with water uh, with with which the water swarmed of their kind after their kind, and every wind bird after their kind, and God saw it, and it was good. Once again, we see the same thing. They were they were producing after their kind, and we see what what we witness in the in the vegetation world, if you like, the world of plants. We see the same thing happening in the world of fish. And birds. Uh, verse 22 and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters with sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And so now the sixth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the, e of the earth after their kind and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and it was good. Now, we know today that the, the process works through something. That I don't understand it all, but we know that this process works through the DNA that all the plants and the animals have. And, and, 
all that information that's required, that genetic information that's uh, that's required to produce, uh, let's say, a tomato plant from a seed is already in that seed. And we know that's with all, all living things. The germ of life is there in the DNA. And that's God's pattern for creation. We go on down to uh, Genesis chapter 6, and we read of uh, Noah and uh, the situation there uh, with, um, with the construction of the ark. God had seen the earth was wicked and, and decided to destroy the earth. But, uh, uh, well, let's start in verse 13. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, uh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy the earth with them. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set a door on the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing a flood of water to the earth to destroy all flesh, which is the breath of life from under heaven, and that everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wives and your sons' wives with you. So we, we know the, this passage here, but I want to just point out that God has given them a pattern there as well. Notice the type of wood they were to use is gopher wood. Now, scholars uh, do not know now what gopher wood is. Maybe this wood is extinct now. We don't know what it is, but Noah knew what it was. He had to cover it inside and out with pitch. That's like tar, like we put on our roads now. He was given the length, 300 cubits. Now, a cubit is, is the length of a, uh, a man's arm from his fingertip to his elbow. 300 of those. Uh, breadth, 50 cubits. Height, 30 cubits. Okay, so he was given the dimensions. There was a window, and it was to be finished a cubit from the top. And we know that all the window was used for. Remember, the dove was sent out through that window. Uh, and one door on the side of the ark, you make three, three decks, lower, second, and third decks. Okay, so we recognize that. And we recognize that this is required by God that Noah followed this pattern. What, what if Noah had decided that he didn't want to use this gopher wood? Would God have been pleased with him? Most certainly not. What if he decided, well, it's not big enough of all the animals on the earth and made change the dimensions? What about if he said, well, I need more air on my ark. I need, I need more windows. Let's put a whole bunch of windows in. And, you know, you see children uh, drawings in children Bibles book of these fanciful boats. Uh, which they call Noah's Ark, and there's always a, like a like a giraffe's neck that's sticking out the top. All that's fanciful. Noah didn't build it like that. He built it to those dimensions because that was what God had supplied. That was how God had wanted this to be. We see the same thing when we go into the law of Moses in the book of Exodus. Uh, in Exodus chapter 25, we see there uh, God gave Moses uh, instructions for the construction of uh, the tabernacle. We see there uh, Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. Let them construct a sanctuary for, for me that I may dwell among them according to all that I'm going to show you as a pattern of the tabernacle and a pattern of its furniture, just how, just so you shall construct it. We can see that, that God gave, um, gave 
Abraham and the children of Israel strict instructions of how to construct that tabernacle. Let's go over to Numbers chapter 8, verses 2 to 4. Well, let's start verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you mount the lamps and the seven lamps uh, will give light into the front of the lampstands. Aaron therefore uh, did so. He mounted its lamp in the front of the lampstand, just as the Lord commanded him. Now, this was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of gold from its base to its flowers, hammered work according to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses, so he made it. Now, you know, I don't suppose that Noah or Aaron and Moses would have really understood why they had to follow these instructions, this pattern. Well, the New Testament gives us uh, a hint to that. Both the uh, ark and the tabernacle, Noah's ark and the tabernacle of Moses were a figure, a, a type of the church. Uh, and as we are saved through water, as we enter into the church, so Noah and his family were saved. There is one way, one door to enter the church. Jesus is that door. There's one door into the ark. Uh, and we see in the tabernacle, all those things, the lamps, they, they uh, are there to, to shine the light of the truth into the tabernacle. They had the altar of incense that, that is the, the prayers of the saints. All of these things have spiritual significance. And that's why they had to, uh, to follow the commands, the pattern that the Lord gave them. Now, we too have a pattern, and we need to follow that pattern too. Our pattern is found in the New Testament. Notice what we read in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, where it says, Brethren, join in following my example, as you observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. We need to recognize that there is a pattern in the New Testament. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I've told you, and now I'll tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of his glory. By the exertion of his power, even he has to subject all things to himself. Now, this sounds pretty important. I think you'll agree with that. Therefore, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern which you have in us. We have a pattern. We have a pattern in the New Testament that tells us how we gain salvation. How, how are we saved? And everyone who's saved in the New Testament follows that same pattern. Their faith comes by hearing the word of God. That, that faith is the faith that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, that he is the Messiah, that he's come to take our sins away. That faith leads us to leave our sinful life and follow Jesus. That's repentance. It leads us to confess our faith before men, and it leads us to be baptized into Christ through baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And every one of us here who are Christians today has followed that same pattern. Now, if you're here today and you followed a different pattern, you need to question that because that's the pattern that we're given. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, that without faith it is impossible to please God. For all who believe in God believe that he exists 
and as a rewarder of those who eagerly seek them. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We have to be willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, just like the Ethiopian eunuch. And as the apostle Paul said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And having done that, we are added to the church. We have a pattern for how to live holy lives. The New Testament gives us that pattern. It tells us how do we walk, how to walk in a holy and righteous way. It, the, the New Testament gives us a pattern for us to worship. We don't get to choose how we worship. Jesus said in, in John 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The truth is found in the Bible, in the New Testament. We have to worship in according to that way. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at the pattern of authority. If you remember, that's the, that's the section that we are dealing with. This is what the, the, uh, the lesson is uh, about now. We looked at this one. Let's look at the next slide. And the pattern that we see uh, in authority is that, first of all, God reveals his will to men. God's authority was made known through either direct con conversation, messages, or dreams. Okay, but that, that's the start. The next, God gave miraculous abilities as signs and evidences that the message came with God's authority. You know, the signs, the miracles, were for a specific reason, and we're going to be looking at that in quite some detail. And the third one, so reveal, confirm, preserve. The Holy Spirit inspired men to write down the revealed authority of God so that others can believe. And we see this throughout the scriptures, this idea of God revealing, confirming, and then preserving. So let us look at some examples of that. We're going to go to, uh, to, to look at how God showed his authority uh, to, to, uh, to Moses, how he revealed it. And we're going to look at Je uh, Exodus chapter 3. Uh, and we're going to go to, to verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, turn there, turn there with me. So Exodus chapter 3. Uh, well, let's, let's, go on, let's go on down uh, a, a little bit. Uh, right, start in verse 1. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. The, pri the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning yet uh, with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now to see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not burnt up? Then the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Let's skip down to verse 13 now. Uh, then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel uh, and I will say to them, the God of our fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, here is God revealing uh, this message to, uh, to Moses. This, this I am is, is recognized throughout the scriptures as the name of God as God um, revealing himself and they would recognize that this was God uh, who was speaking through Moses. So this is what, 
This is what he had to say. I am sent me. And that was that was the 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 way that they would know that Moses was from God. Uh, okay, let's go to chapter four now, and we'll see how remember the what we have is God revealed his truth to him in chapter four, uh, starting in verse one. We read, now Moses wasn't sure of himself at all, but notice, then Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it down on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of, A uh, of Jacob, has appeared to you. Now, this is that confirmation. And we need to think, this is a, a, a wonderful sign that was given. This sign was so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, appeared to him. And that's the purpose of the signs. Okay, so we said it's, it's uh, reveal, confirm, preserve. Let's go down to verse 34 now uh, and verse 27. Uh, we could go to many places here. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So that's the preserve. Now, Moses was the one God got that God got to the write the first five books of the Bible. And this was to preserve what was revealed and what was confirmed so that we too can believe. The same is true when we see Jesus. Uh, he revealed, he confirmed, and he preserved. So we go to the New Testament now to uh, uh, the Gospel of John. John chapter 8, uh, and we're going to go start in verse uh, 56. There, okay. So John 8, and uh well let's go on let's go let's go on down verse 54 jesus answered if i glory myself my glory is nothing it is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our god you have not come to know him but i know him and if i say that i do not know him i'm a liar like you but i do know him and keep his word your father abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Now listen, this is what Jesus' answer was. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. You may recognize that from when God was speaking to Abraham, uh, to, to Moses, at the burning, burning bush. And we can see the response of the people in hearing this. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, we could, we could go on and look at other so many other places where Jesus revealed the truth. But I think this gives us a nice connection to what we read about Moses. Well, what about uh, what about uh, the confirmation? Well, we go over to Matthew uh, chapter nine, verse six, uh, for that. Notice uh, now this is uh, when Jesus healed the lame man. Okay, let's go on down. Uh, this uh, well, let's start with this one. Get him into a boat. Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, 
Take courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to them, this fellow blasphemes. How, how can a man say your sins are forgiven? And so they just thought, well, he's a blasphemer. This is, this is the sort of thing they wanted against Jesus. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easy to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. Uh, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, then he said to the para paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. You see, through the sign, the words that Jesus had been, had been confirmed and they glorified God. So what about the, the uh, preserve? We go back to John, John chapter 20. Uh, and we'll read verses uh, 30 and 31. Notice, and I think this is just such a wonderful passage and such so, so encouraging. I find this incredibly encouraging. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. We have to realize that the New Testament is perfect, but it doesn't cover everything that Jesus did. It did not cover, does not cover all the signs that Jesus did. Now, I want you to notice, we've looked in this previously, uh, this, this word signs, okay? And this note down here, uh, John 20, verse 31, or attesting miracles, these are miracles. These signs are those which confirm the words that are spoken. Okay. So therefore, not many other so therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you may have life in his name. These miracles, these words, these confirmations are preserved in the Bible. What is the purpose of the signs? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The modern uh, Pentecostal movement don't recognize this is the purpose of the signs. But that's what the Bible says. And this is the reason why we don't see Bible miracles today, because they have been written down. We don't need them. Let, let's go on. Let's go on. And we think of not only uh, was it Jesus uh, who did this, but, but the apostles as well did this. The Bible tells us that through, through the Holy Spirit, the, to the apostles were revealed the word of God, which they spoke and they taught. Uh, and Jesus tells us about that in John chapter 16. And uh, we'll start in verse 12, where Jesus said, well, oh, hang on, hang on, I'm ahead of myself here. Okay, John chapter 16 and verse 12. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. This is, this is the night that Jesus was betrayed. He's speaking to his disciples. But there are other things. He can't tell them everything because they, they could not keep it in their brain. Verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Uh, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So this is the, the, the apostles and then the prophets were given this word 
and they spoke it to those who hear. This is the revealing. Well, after revealing comes the the confirming. We go to to, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 1 where it says there, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, and was confirmed by us, by those who heard God, uh, who heard God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. This is the confirming. You notice, this is the purpose of signs, wonders, and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The word, let's have a look up here. The word was heard and spoken by the apostles and prophets were confirmed by those who heard it through the signs and wonders and various miracles. And just like as we saw before uh, that following uh, uh, the confirmation, there also is preservation. We see in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 3, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my inside of the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, but has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. So the apostles and prophets were given the word of God. Now there's a wonderful passage over in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll go to, to verse 14. Therefore, beloved, Since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. Do you see that? Verse 15, Paul wrote to you. As in all his letters, speaking of them these things, which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of their scriptures to their own destruction. So we see here that the pattern that God has given us stands. God revealed his will through various means. He confirmed it by miraculous signs, and then he preserved it. Through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, men wrote down the revealed authority of God so that all others can believe. And we're so blessed to be living in this age where we have free and easy access to the scriptures. We can see this word preserved, this is the authority of God. This is indeed the word of God. And we can be assured of this because God confirmed it through the signs, miracles, and various wonders that he had. Okay. Let's look at the time. Let's let's go and have a look at the video uh, that I made earlier. Yeah, we're back. So we do have the authority of God through his word. And we can see that God has shown it to us that it's his authority. And we can believe because we can read of those 
signs and wonders in the way that God has preserved them through the Bible. We can be assured that this is the word of God and that by following that, we too can have life in his name. So now it's over to you, my dear brethren. If you have any questions or comments, just please unmute yourself and uh, we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask a question. And you know, I remember one wise man once told me that the only foolish question is the question not asked. <laughs> because you may think, oh, everyone will know this, but that may be quite untrue and everyone else is thinking oh i'd love to ask this question but i'm too embarrassed so if you have a question please ask it or if you have a comment to make please feel free to make a comment over to you hello brothers and sisters dominic Thank you so much, Brother Kate, for this wonderful study on the authority on the authority pattern in the in the Bible. Uh, in the last Saturday, when we heard about this, and with this continuation, it's a great study, and I would like to commend and say that it's very important for us to understand that uh, God revealed His word to the apostles and prophets. And we no more need any signs today for us to again add to what has been written because the Bible is complete. And um, in Revelation 22, 18 and 20, it talks that we, we don't need to add or, sub, or subtract what has been written in this, in this scroll. And so I'm so happy in my heart with this study. And we we do not need to check on what happens to the world, but emphatically follow the Mark 16, 15 that Brother Kate has read, that God continues to confirm his word. And we have that time to reach out to many who are, who are lost and talk to them about the same. And they have not heard about this. But if we take that um chance to go and reach out to them they may also see the same truth and they can change thank you so much yeah you're very welcome thank you for for that um and dominic i really appreciate you um okay so i've got a question here from alios um let me just read it quickly Okay, so uh, Alios is asking about a man who came up to him and said he had a nightmare of, and uh, he believed it of religious significance. Now, uh, so the question is, do we still receive visions from God through dreams? Brother, you answered quite correctly. Uh, dreams are just an outlet of our... Of our, of our brain. Now, I think that we've got a passage here. Uh, I quoted it in the, in, the, um, in the video. Let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, yes, God spoke to people in the past through dreams. But notice Hebrews chapter 1 and starting in uh, verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Okay, let's pause there. Verse one. So God spoke to the fathers in many ways and in many, and he spoke to them in dreams. We know that. God, God even spoke to wicked kings in dreams. We think of in, uh, in Daniel, Daniel chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar. A heathen king, God spoke to him in a dream. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, Daniel was able to interpret that. But that was long ago. But now in these last days. Now, I want you to just think about this for a minute. Because the Hebrew writer says that when he was writing, he was writing in the last days. 
there are three ages of men. There was the patriarchal age, which went from the time of Adam all the way through to, 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 to Moses. And God spoke in so many different ways. He spoke mostly to the fathers. Then we have the Mosaic age, the second age. And that went from the, the time of Moses to the time of Christ. And he spoke to uh, the people through the prophets. And we read of all those prophets throughout the, the Old Testament. Okay, so that's what it was. But now we're in the last days. He has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Now, Jesus speaks to us through what was revealed to the holy apostles and prophets. He's writing to, we read this earlier, he's writing, or he's speaking to the apostles. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you, apostles, into all truth. Now, we got to pause there. All truth. There is no more truth to be revealed. It was revealed all to the apostles and prophets. The Holy Spirit will not speak on his own initiative. Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, and therefore I say that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And so we put this together. We see that in these last days, God has spoken through his son. How? The son had given through the Holy, uh, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets the words that were written down. We have all truth. No, God no longer uh, speaks to us through dreams. Those are quite right, Brother Alios. Uh, uh, dreams are just an outlet for our brain. So congratulations on that. I think you've interpreted that very well. Very pleased with that. Good on you. Okay. Anyone else got anything they would like to add? Okay, well, let me see. Who am I going to ask? I'm going to ask Jackson. Would you like to uh, um, uh, unmute yourself and close in a word of prayer for us? Yeah. Dear Father, we must heaven. We'll be dining. Father, would like to thank thee for viewing us as we study a portion of your words. We thank thee for Brother Keith for his effort to bring us together to share and so that we may be edified and, and that we might bring this message to other to others. Father, uh, as we end this service, that you will help us uh, to be patient, remind us always of the teaching and help us to be walking in that footsteps. In Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Jackson. Okay, lovely to see you all. I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be sending out tonight the the um, the email with the video and the and the um, study notes. Have a wonderful Lord's Day tomorrow, and uh, God bless you all. Thank you, and goodbye for now.